I believe in miracles because I believe in God. You are responsible before God for today. God wants to show His power and His greatness in our lives. Greetings in the name of the Lord. Friend, I trust your day has been a blessing so far. We have more blessings for you in this program, good music and singing, and my message for you today is entitled, The Disobedient Christian. Friend, this is the type of Christian you do not want to be before the Lord. It's a message of warning. I trust it will help you and be a blessing unto you. But first, we have Zion. Come on in, Jesus. Come on in, Jesus, never to depart. I believe the blood of Jesus washes away all my sins. Come on in, come on in, come on in. I believe He's the Son of God and He died for me. He's bigger than our habits and can set us free. Just yield your mind to Jesus and He'll set your soul on fire. He'll give to you the Holy Ghost if that is your desire. Come on in, Jesus, come into my heart. Come on in, Jesus, never to depart. I believe the blood of Jesus washes away all my sins. Come on in, come on in, come on in. Washes away all my sins Come on in, come on in, come on in Come on in, Jesus, come into my heart Come on in, Jesus, never to depart I believe the blood of Jesus Washes away all my sins Come on in, come on in, come on in The title of tonight's message is The Disobedient Christian. Now, we're not talking about sinners, talking about Christians, disobedience. Many Christians feel comfortable saying, well, I'm saved, I'm born again, I don't do any sinning, I'm free of sin, and they automatically assume they're on their way to heaven. And that not that's not necessarily the case. Yes, living free from sin is vital, spiritually vital. But there's also something else in this formula or equation to get to heaven. That's obedience. Obedience. Obedience before the Lord is absolute must. Are you obedient before the Lord? Because that's what this message really stresses, obedience. You say, well, I, I'm not sure. How do we know whether we're obedient or disobedient? It's why we have the Bible. It's why man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. Because the Bible is our spiritual measuring stick that reveals to a person whether they, their life is pleasing unto God or displeasing. So if you fail and neglect to study the word, how can you really know whether you're pleasing or displeasing God? And if you don't know, that is a very dangerous place to be. 
If you're unsure, even in the slightest, whether you are pleasing the Lord or displeasing him, you better find out and know, because this is an age of great deceit and seduction. And I'm going to get into it more in the scriptures, how the Lord, because of people's disobedience, God would send them strong delusion and they would believe a lie and be damned. Think of it, people believing, expecting to go to heaven, and then they open up their eyes in hell. And I'm going to start this message with a question that Jesus gave. Now, this is Jesus asking the question, the son of the living God, our master and our Lord, stressing the importance of obedience. And it's found in Luke chapter 6, verse 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? That's a profound question for every Christian and so-called Christian needs to ask themselves. Our Lord Jesus could have asked this question over and over to multitudes of people for the past 2,000 years. It's a question he could ask of many professing Christians today. And if the Lord were to appear in our midst, those of you online, if the Lord would appear right in your living room or wherever you're watching, would he ask this question of you and your life? Why call me Lord and do not the things that I say? This verse is worth taking note of to ponder and to meditate, to examine with your own life if you count your soul dear and near and dear. Because throughout the Bible, it is made very clear that the Lord requires obedience unto him and his word. How often in Jesus' parables his teachings, does he liken children of God, Christians, to servants? And he himself as the Lord, the master, the king. Jesus structures his parables this way to emphasize the importance of obedience. Since the beginning of the human race, God has required obedience to his word. And it was disobedience to his word that caused humanity to fall and to sin. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were given instructions to follow by God. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. This was the word of God given to a perfect man and woman. A simple instruction. And by this simple instruction, this simple command, Adam and Eve could demonstrate their love and devotion to God. God didn't require much of them. However, when they chose to disobey the word of the Lord, their disobedience brought terrible consequences upon themselves and the human race to follow. The lesson to learn, any time you disobey the word of God, in matters small or great, there will be consequences. Think about it. All Adam and Eve did was eat a piece of fruit. That's it. They didn't lie. They didn't murder someone. They didn't steal from someone. They simply did that which God said don't do.
Because of it, they were cursed. So too was the earth and the animal kingdom unto this present day, 6,000 years later. One disobedience. And it was a disobedience that didn't harm anybody. One disobedience. Some Christians believe it's okay to disobey the word of the Lord in small matters. But it is not okay. Because sooner or later in this life or the next, they will reap what they sow. You see, Adam and Eve were not punished for eating forbidden fruit. They were punished because they disobeyed the word of the Lord. Another example of this is in 1 Samuel chapter 15. King Saul was given the word of God by the prophet Samuel, instructions that he was to follow. Go into battle, destroy the kingdom of the Amalekites. That meant killing every human and every animal. Leave nothing alive. King Saul goes forth with this command. Won a great victory. However, upon return, it is learned he spared the king and the best of the livestock. And when he returns, he declares unto the prophet of God, I have performed the will of God. That's like a lot of Christians today. I have performed God's will. When confronted by Samuel about his disobedience to God's word, suddenly it's, oh, 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 well, uh, yeah, about that. Um, well, let me tell you, it was the people. The people, they wanted to do sacrifice, so th they made me do this. It went from I have performed God's will to now making excuses. Nothing can be hidden or covered from God. But what was God's response? 1 Samuel 15, 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken or listen than the fat of rams. In other words, God delights in obedience far more than any sacrifice or good work you could do in his name. God places emphasis on obedience to his word. But if you don't know his word, how are you going to obey him and please him? Never let the devil, people, or self deceive you into believing that good works and sacrifices made will supersede obedience to the word of God. Christians have made this mistake. Israelites have made this mistake, this fatal, eternal mistake for thousands of years that their good works will somehow justify them or cover up their disobedience in other areas. As if God will overlook it, he doesn't. Disobedience to the word of God is a serious matter to God. And he's demonstrated it in the word. He's given examples in the word. 1 Samuel 15, 23, Samuel continues, For rebellion, and we're speaking of God's word, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, because you have disobeyed God's word, he hath also rejected thee from being king. This verse says God views disobedience to his word 
as rejecting his word altogether. If you don't live and abide by my word, you might as well not even have my word. That's how God views it. God likens disobedience to his word as rebellion and stubbornness, which to God equals witchcraft and idolatry. That's serious, harsh judgment. But it's the judgment of God. Never allow yourself to be deceived about disobedience to God's word. Samson is another good example. From birth, he was ordained of God to be a judge over Israel, a Nazarite, who would bring deliverance to God's people from the oppression of the Philistines, who were the Israelites' enemies. God gave Samson supernatural strength to perform the divine will of God. The symbol of his strength, his uncut hair. Being a Nazarite, a razor was to never touch his head. And as a young man, Samson performed numerous acts of supernatural strength against the Philistines. However, Samson disobeyed the word of the Lord by reaching out for foreign flesh. He desired a Philistine woman, which was forbidden by the law of God. The Israelites were not to intermingle, but they were to separate from all of the people and their cultures that were surrounding them. They were sanctified unto the Lord. Samson's disobedience cost him his power with God and then his life. Simply because he desired a woman of another culture. Again, he didn't murder anybody. He didn't harm anyone. He didn't lie. He didn't do some terrible work against anyone or against God. He simply wanted that which the Word of God said you're not allowed to have. So, the day comes, Samson tells the secret of his strength to Delilah, Delilah, this Philistine woman. Then he lays his head upon her lap and falls asleep. She cuts his hair. The Philistines come for Samson. When he awakes, he's in deceit now. This is what it means to disobey God's word. He's in deceit. Because up to this point, disobeying God's word, he still had power. He still had power. But the time came, he kept disobeying and disobeying. The devil caught up to him, and his hair was cut. So the Philistines come in. He thinks he's going to go out just as always. Shake himself, and the power of God's going to move, and he's going to do more damage in the name of the Lord to the Philistine people. But when he shakes himself, the Spirit of God is departed. Now he falls into the hands of his enemies. Deceived. That's what happens when you disobey truth. You open yourself up to deceit. And the scary thing is, is you don't even know it. Like Samson, you think you're going to rise up as before and do the will of God, and you don't even know that the Spirit of God has departed. Some people, they don't wake up to this fact until they wake up in hell. The Apostle Paul wrote that in the end, before the Antichrist would reveal himself to the world, there would be a great falling away from truth. A great falling away. People turning away from truth. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, the day of the Lord, the day of His return, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. You see, a society like ours today that lacks love and respect for truth, for the Word of God, they will fail to live according to the standard of truth. And this leaves people vulnerable to, to, to deceit and seduction. And that's the way it is in many churches. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 and 11. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Deceivableness of unrighteousness. They're deceived about their unrighteous works. Why? Because it says, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They don't love the truth. They don't respect the truth. Therefore, they're given over to deceit. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusions that they should believe a lie. Strong delusions. God sends them. That's what God thinks about disobedience to his word. He will make sure they're deceived and that they stay deceived until they wake up in hell. If a person doesn't value God and his word and his truth, God doesn't value that person, whether they call themselves a Christian or not. Strong delusion because of deceivableness of unrighteousness, because they lack the love for truth. Thinking they're saved, but they're not. In deceit, people will believe themselves to be something in God, before God, that they're not. Deceit originates, it starts, again, as I say, with a lack of love and respect for truth. Without the proper love and respect for truth, you won't take in the truth, and you won't live by it, and you won't obey it. James 1, through 24, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is likened unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself... And goeth his way, and straightway forget what manner of man he was. This can be said about sinners and Christians. There's a lot of sinners that can tune into the live stream or wander into church, sit down. They can hear the truth, but because they have no love or respect for it, oh, okay. They hear it, they get up, walk out, and forget all about what they heard in every revelation they receive. But you know what? What's even worse? There's a lot of Christians that do that. They'll come to church every service. They'll hear the word. They'll even open their Bible and read it and understand it. Oh, okay, shut it. Leave out the doors and back to their old ways of doing. That's not in accordance and obedience to God's word. Such people like this forget what they look like in God's mirror because they choose to forget, because they have no love and respect for truth. God's word is the standard for a person's life. Like a mirror, we are to use it to examine ourselves. And if you see shortcomings, faults, and failures, don't turn away and forget about it. You open, because if you do that, you're opening yourself up to deceit, to be deceived, to believe and think you're okay before God when in fact you are not. Consider the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 17, then moving to 20 and 21. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. 
not by what they profess, not by what they think of them and say of themselves, by their fruits. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Not everyone that professes to be a Christian is going to heaven. Who's going to heaven? He that obeys the word of the Lord. You shall know them by their fruits, by their actions, by their lifestyle, by the light that shines through their life. Do all of these things match the word of God? In this society today, as deceit and seduction become more and more prevalent, permeating throughout society, through that man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, people will claim to be Christian, which is supposed to be Christ-like, when in reality their lives are nothing like what they proclaim. I've seen it today in the news, and it's a trend of deceit. More and more, there are famous or popular people coming out, professing Christianity, professing to be born again. It's deceit. How do you know? Look at their fruits. Listen to them long enough. Look at them, their actions, their lifestyle, their dress, how they carry themselves. You'll see it. You'll know them by their fruits. But the devil uses people like this in society. Why? To lower the standard of what it means to be a Christian. Because these people in society, they're not opening up their Bible to find out. But they see some of these famous people coming forth professing Christianity to be born again. Yet they don't deny self. They don't live free from sin. And they're even professing as such. An age of deceit. Lives falling short of God's word. In examining the fruit of the life of a person's life, the only standard is truth. Not people's opinions, not your feelings, truth. The word of God. And the fruit that should be examined the closest when you examine fruit is not the fruit of your neighbor. It's the fruit in your own life. And if everyone in the body of Christ would do this, Everybody, what a garden of Eden it would be in the body of Christ. The fruit of your life, when was the last time you examined it? When was the last time you even thought of it? How does it measure up to the standard of God's word? Is there any corrupt fruit? Any fruit of deceit or disobedience to the word of God? any inward or outward resistance to God's word. Are your fruits according to the word of God?
friends. It's time to boldly step out and let God be your financial partner. Invest in this Jesus Outreach Ministry. We not only reach out to the world, but also to your local community. Share with us your tithes and offerings, and let us send you free books, magazines, and our weekly broadcast. Take time to grow in grace, win souls, and enjoy God's financial miracles for your family. God's way is perfect. Prove God and His promises. Romans 6, verses 16 and 22. Know ye not that to whom you, ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Who do you obey? Sin, the world, people, the word of God, self? Who is your master indeed? But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. To be a qualified fruit inspector, a person must possess knowledge of God's word, coupled with godly wisdom. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. To obtain knowledge, you must study God's word. And then with godly fear, you desire and seek the Lord for his wisdom to be able to rightly divide his word in a way that's pleasing to him. Don't think you can just automatically read it, understand it, and perform it yourself. You need God's wisdom, his spiritual discernment, to rightly divide the word of truth. There's a right way to divide it, and there's a wrong way. James 1.5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. And James 3.17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. It's sad because many Christians, they'll stand in shame before God in the end. Because in life they lack, it's either they lack the knowledge of God or the wisdom to rightly divide it. And this results in failing to correctly inspect their fruit before God. And when you fail to correctly inspect your fruit, that opens up the door for deceit. To believe you're something in God that you're not. Failing to correct, correctly inspect the fruit in your own life, again, it opens up a person to self-deceit and Lucifer's deceit. Truth is the only standard for a Christian's life. Truth is the only safety against deceit. When there is no truth in action, that means the Christian sets their own standard for their life. To measure their life and to inspect their own fruit, they use their own standard to determine whether or not they're pleasing God. But the fallacy of this is a person's standard is not God's standard. A person's standard is not truth. This is what happened to God's chosen people in the Old Testament. When Israel forsook the law of God, they got into big trouble. Why? It tells us in the book of Judges. In Judges 17, 6, it says... But every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Their own standard, not God's. 
When Christians fail to live by the standard of God's word, instead choosing to do that which is right in their own eyes, this, the result of that is hypocrisy. That's the formula for hypocrisy. Jesus spoke of this about the religious rulers in his day. They were supposed to be religious, but they did that which was right in their own eyes. Matthew 15, 7 and 8, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, because their heart was far from truth. Jesus hates the hypocrite. Why? Because a hypocrite misrepresents God. A hypocrite misrepresents God's standard of truth that a Christian is supposed to live by. They claim to be a Christian, Christ-like, when they're not. They do that which is right in their own eyes instead because they do not love, they do not respect truth. So they become a hindrance to people that would come into the kingdom. Matthew 23, 13, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. You misrepresent me. You won't come in, and you're hindering others from coming in. To be a hypocrite is a dangerous spiritual condition, obviously. Professing to be a light of truth and deceiving themselves into believing it when they're not. Because deep within their heart, the reality is they do not desire nor do they love the light of truth. You see, a hypocrite's profession of faith, it is flesh inspired. It is demonically inspired. It is not truth inspired. John 3, 19 and 20. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. There are people, sinners and professing, professing Christians alike, they simply don't want to obey the truth. They call themselves a Christian. They'll make a profession or a confession because they want to go to heaven. But they don't want to submit to truth. The words of Jesus, John 3, 21. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light. Notice that word, he that doeth truth. He that obeys truth cometh to the light. That his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. A person with an honest heart, they're willing to come into the light of truth, the light of the word, so that the light of truth will reveal in them, uncover in them anything unlike God, anything that might be displeasing to God. They want to know because they have a respect and a love for truth and for God. Christ sinners will do this. If there is a level of love and respect for truth and the truth shines upon them and the Holy Spirit has them where he wants them, They'll come into that light of truth and they'll yield to be free of that which is wrong in their life, free from that which displeases God. Listen to what Jesus said about his true followers. Now, this goes back to the starting scripture. Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? John 14, 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. There's a, that's a powerful phrase. If you love me, 
Keep my commandments. Obey my word. Jesus measures our love for him by our love for truth. Another way to put it, Jesus measures our love for him by our obedience to his word. That's how he's going to measure your love. It's not going to be, oh, I love you, Jesus. I show up to church. I give my tithes, my offerings. That's not it. He measures your love by obedience to his word. Let me give you just a few examples, going into more of what I'm speaking about here. Again, relating back to the opening scripture. Why call me Lord and you don't do what I have said? Matthew 22, verses 37 and 38. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Do you love the Lord with all of you? Or only part of you? Is he your first love, or is he your second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth love? Again, why call me Lord? And do not the things that I say. Does he sit on the throne of your heart? Or does something or someone else abide there? Matthew 22, 39. And the second is likened unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, does Jesus mean neighbor next door? Oh, no. To understand what Jesus is saying here about loving your neighbor as yourself... Go to Luke chapter 10. Read the story of the Good Samaritan. And understand, as you read this story and you study it for yourself, it's important to take note that in Jesus' day, the Jews and the Samaritans were bitter enemies. Jesus was telling the Jews, Love the Sam your neighbor is your, the Samaritans are your neighbor. He was telling them to love their enemies. John 13, 35, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Do you have love for your brothers and sisters, all of them? Why call me Lord and do not the things that I say? Do you have love for your enemies? Why call me Lord and do not the things that I say? John 5, 14. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and saith unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee. Do you live free from sin? Remember, Jesus said, If you love me, you, you will keep my commandments. And he commanded this man to go and sin no more. And he also threatened him that if you do, something worse will happen. And Christians say you can't live free from sin. In 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter warns, when a person comes out of sin into salvation through the blood of Jesus, and then they turn around and go back into the pollution of the world. They become entangled in sin in the world again. It would have been better for that one to have never known the truth, to have never come into the truth, than to have come into the truth and then walked away from it. The consequences are worse. To come into the truth and then disobey truth. John 8, 11, and Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Jesus makes it clear in John's gospel, chapter 5 and chapter 8. Jesus makes it clear. He frees us of sin to not go back into sin. He frees us of sin that we may become servants of his righteousness, producing fruits of his holiness. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. And being assembled together with them, this is Jesus, 
commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Have you been baptized in the Holy Ghost since you believed, since you become a child of God? If not, why? Why? Jesus says you are to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. But if you fail to receive this gift of God, Jesus will say, why call me Lord and do not the things that I say? The word also tells us that he would give the Holy Ghost to them that obey. To the obedient is this gift given. So if you proclaim to be a Christian and you've been without the Holy Ghost week after week, month after month, year after year, Maybe it's time to examine your life in the mirror of the word to see why it is you are not receiving the Holy Ghost when he said he would give it to the obedient. Matthew 4, 4. But he answered and said unto him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Do you value the word of God more than your daily food for your body? Do you take in the word of God each day as you take in food for your body? Do you yield to the strength of God's word to nourish your spiritual person just as you yield to the strength of your food to nourish your physical person? Are you as consistent with the word of God as you are consistent with eating physical food? How strong or weak you are in the Lord is dependent, really, upon your appetite for the Word. Matthew 6, 6, the words of Jesus again. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Is your life being rewarded? Do you have the blessings in favor of God? If not, maybe it's check. Maybe it's time to check if your time in the prayer closet is missing. Because if you're missing out on the blessings and the grace of God, maybe it's because God finds you missing in the prayer closet. Matthew 9, 14 and 15. Then came... To him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. Today the bridegroom is not in our midst. And as Jesus' followers, we are instructed to fast. We are instructed by Jesus to fast as we await for his return. But many Christians don't think they need to fast. Jesus says you do. Many Christians don't want to fast, so they don't fast. Jesus' response would be, why call me Lord and do not the things that I say? These are just a few examples, demonstrations, of what this message really means in a nutshell. You can go into the word of God yourself, the four gospels, everything that Jesus has said, and go down the line and measure yourself the same way as I brought measurement before you tonight through these verses. But you have to remember this. Christians, servants of the Lord, they do not have the authority or the privilege to determine for themselves what they will obey in the word of God and what they won't obey. That's not the servant's privilege. Matthew 16, 24. 
Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Christians are servants. Jesus is the master. Christians are to obey Jesus in all things. But to do that, you have to deny yourself, or you'll never do it. You see, being born again is no guarantee of heaven. Being born again only qualifies you for heaven. A born-again Christian is to live a life of obedience to the will and the word of God. Take heed to the Apostle Paul's warning to the church at Ephesus, in which he, the Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, separates the obedient Christian from the disobedient Christian. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, Let no man deceive you with vain words, false words, empty words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Because of false doctrines, false words, false teachings that do not value and respect truth, it caused the wrath of God to fall upon children of disobedience, God's children who disobeyed. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. You separate from such. Beware of false doctrines. Beware of people's opinions that justify or encourage you to disobey God's word. In God's eyes, it is not a light thing to disobey him and his word. And these disobedient children will face God's wrath. Separate from disobedience in any form, in doctrine or in person, you separate from it. Paul continues in Ephesians 5, 8 through 10, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You used to be in sin. You used to be in the false. No more since coming into the kingdom. No. Now you walk in the light of the Lord. You walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. The fruit of your life will prove, will demonstrate God's approval. That's what walking in obedience to truth does. When you obey the truth in your life, day after day, your life demonstrates God's approval. It demonstrates all of the right fruits. Goodness, righteousness, truth. This is pleasing to God. Friend, listening to this message tonight, where are you with the Lord? It's important to understand and know. You may call yourself a Christian. You may profess a conversion. But where are you right now with the Lord? That conversion may have happened 10, 20, 30 years ago. But right now, today, is your life pleasing unto the Lord? And if you don't know, that is not an ideal, enviable position to be in. Because you could go tonight, go to bed, and wake up in eternity on tomorrow, not knowing whether your life is pleasing to God or not. You must know through the standard of God's Word, through the mirror of the Word. And that's why you keep the mirror ever before you, day after day after day. And you never lose sight of the mirror. Just as before you walk out the door, you look at your physical body in the mirror to make sure all is in order, everything in place. Every day, look into the mirror of the Word to make sure all is in order before God and that everything is in place. 
Because the day will come sooner or later if the Lord tarries. You'll face eternity. You'll face death. And you won't know when it comes. You have to be ready. Whether it's for the rapture or for death for eternity, you must be ready and stay ready. It's one thing to get ready, but then you have to stay ready. And you do so through the mirror of the word. Friend, I hope this message was able to reveal to you in a very clear way what God thinks of disobedience. And if there's any disobedience in your life, if there's any sin, and you want to pray, well, let's pray together right now. Repeat this prayer with me. Say, oh God, forgive me. If there be anything in my life displeasing to you, any sin, any disobedience, forgive me, Lord, and I will serve you the rest of my life. And I believe the power in the blood of Jesus washes away all of my sin, all of my disobedience. Forgive me, Lord. Say, come into my heart, dear Jesus, and amen. And friend, if you meant that prayer, Jesus is yours. He's with you now. And let's pray for the healing that you need in your body. When Jesus spilled his divine blood on the cross, it was a twofold atonement, salvation for the soul, healing for the body. And Jesus said his believers would lay hands on the sick and they would recover. Friend, I'm the Lord's believer. So put your hand against mine on the screen as a simple act of faith. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I bring the people unto you now. God, do move for the need in their life. Lord, let the healing power from the blood stripes of Jesus go into their bodies to make them well. Heal each one. Heal them now in the holy blood name of Jesus. And Lord, we give you the honor, the praise, and the glory for moving for them. And amen. And friend, watch every sign of improvement and know God is with you and he is moving for you. And when you have the opportunity, friend, I want to encourage you, help us to keep the program on in your area. You can donate by going to our website, earnestangely.org, and there you can donate online. It's safe and secure, and what you give helps us to win souls, and God will bless you in a great way for it. And remember, when you have the chance, Pay us a visit at Grace Cathedral every weekend, three services, Friday night, two services on Sunday. You're always welcome to worship the Lord with us. And remember, you are special to God. Join us live every Sunday morning at 10 on YouTube and Facebook as we live stream our morning worship service. You will be blessed with great music and a wonderful message. This program was paid for by the partners of Ernest Angie Ministries. 